action cinema has been one of the staples of the cinematic output in terms of genre since the very creation of cinema. The effects that this has had on film have been profound and it can be traced back to 1903 with the release of The Great Train Robbery. This popularised story elements and it would in turn inspire not only westerns but would go on to the creation of the action genre as well. It pioneered the use of parallel editing which would go on to allow action films to flourish with having the ability to show two or more distinct events at the same time to create larger drama and tension in a scene. Over the course of this essay, we will be looking back at the history of action cinema in America and how it relates to genre theory. Genre actually comes from a French word meaning type or kind. Uh, and in the case of this, genre refers to t different types of films. Genre movies are those often commercial feature films which go through rep repetition and variation to tell similar stories with familiar characters and familiar situations. In the case of, of genre theory, Lawrence Alloway in 1963 had this to say, the meaning of a single movie is inseparable from the larger pattern of contextual analysis to other movies, but it's not even limited to other movies. TV shows also are now becoming involved. Now what this suggests is the fact that films cannot simply be evaluated by themselves, they have to be evaluated in the greater context of their entire genre, but also now at this point we're not limited to even being compared to things like TV shows and now with the way modern society is they have to be compared to even video games and comic books. You could even argue films such as Hardcore Henry, uh, which is a film shot entirely from a POV shot, have more in common with a first-person video game than they do with films in their own movie genre such as The Bourne Identity. By the time of the 1960s, westerns have developed much more into what could be received potentially as an action movie. They often featured an all-American hero that would save people's lives, and but they also went on to do a hell of a lot more than just that, and to help explain it, here's someone else. At their most profound, westerns deal with the intersection of the individual and society. You have a sense of what is gained and what is lost by belonging to a community, as opposed to living in the wilderness, where as an individual you're completely free. It's the arrival of civilization in the form of those ranchers and farms and small towns that means that the hero is going to have to sacrifice some of that freedom. Alive or dead, it's your choice. As John Wayne's, in particular, career kind of progressed and improved, uh, the action took on a much more spiteful and hateful uh, tinge to it, often being aimed towards uh, Native Americans. The films often had a racist view and this is arguably, upon re-evaluation, is made even worse by uh, John Wayne's own political views in which, in a Playboy magazine article in 1971, he himself said, I believe in white supremacy. The principal things about these Western films is their reliance on the use of guns over um, what now would be more of a use of fists and how it seemed, and how these films kind of had the guise of bringing civilization to uncivilized places. Mm -hmm. Often this was done through the use of violence and through the use of subjugation of the Native Americans. And John Wayne is almost seen as always being the hero, and in cases even when he is not the traditional hero, such as in the case of The Searchers, but is instead as, show, as being shown as being incredibly mm -hmm. effective. Action was shown as being the only effective tool that these people could use to not only stay safe but to right wrongs because there was no civilization. It was common for the hero to always be living on the, the fringes of society, never being able to go home after the fight, instead having to ride off into the sunset to what we would assume would be their next fight. And in the case of the Man from the, the Man with No Name trilogy, that's exactly what happened. Clint Eastwood gets to ride into the sunset, but then we know there's the next movie where he goes to the next town and rights those wrongs. One of the most important films in the in the history of action film, and often regarded as one of the greatest action films ever made, is Die Hard. Die Hard is a Christmas action movie, in my opinion, more of a Christmas movie, that features a police officer by the name of John McClane, played by Bruce Willis, who is um, unintentionally drawn into a terrorist attack, and he is forced to deal with the situation all while trying to save the life of his estranged wife. The film was directed by John McTiernan, who at this point was at the height of his game. He had just finished doing Predator and various other action films, and he was kind of, he kind of remains to even now, this, uh, working, I think most recently in 2005, um, 
was kind of somewhat more of a director for hire. He was someone who you could hire to just do an amazing job and he understood how to make just great quality films. And John McTiernan was brought in and he just understands structure, he understands story, he understands characters. And from that he knows how to give people an amazing experience. And one thing that John McTiernan talks about with the character of John McClane was this. And this is directly from the director's commentary of the movie. He didn't like himself very much, but he was doing the best he could. This is referring to Bruce Willis's character. As John, as John McTiernan here clearly states, he is someone who doesn't like himself very much. And this can be seen in small, moment, small moments of characterization, where he is, where just after talking to his wife, he has a moment where, realising that he didn't actually say what he wanted to say, he hits his head on the wall, uh, in a case of clearly being annoyed with him. He has moments in the very beginning of the movie where he is shown as being incredibly human with the fact that he's scared of flying that uh, after completing his flight he takes his shoes and socks off and just rubs his feet as a way to kind of calm himself down. A second thing that is incredibly important in the, the structure of Die Hard is John McClane decides to stay. Often in action films even now you get a hero who is a soldier. They are given a mission and you know they really realistically could not say no. In the case of John McClane, he has the availability to leave. He has a moment where he can, where everything starts happening and he pans over and sees the exit sign. And you can tell that he registers it and then he goes back to where he was originally looking and he decides to stay. And that is a really important moment because it, it makes John McClane seem much more relatable, much more understanding. That for, for one split second, he nearly made the decision that I think everyone else in the real world would, which is I'm going to get the hell out of Dodge. Also, another important part to the structure is, it's and the very first bit of, of Die Hard, for the first 20 minutes, there is not a single piece of action. As I said before, you just get to live with the characters. But you also get incredibly important exposition. So you get this idea that some of the floors of the building are left to be, are still yet to be fully constructed. That plays a role later on in the movie. You get a sense of the geography of the space when he's walking through the lobby of the building. And this, again, becomes really important so you understand where all the bad guys are in conjunction to one another when they appear in the subsequent scenes. Also, a really important thing is for the first bit of the, when, when the action gets going, John McClane is seen to be doing quite well. He starts off with just a pistol, but he quickly gets a machine gun. He then quickly gets the explosives. And he is seen to be doing really, really well until it all goes pear-shaped. And for the rest of the film, he's on, his, he's on the back foot. He loses the machine gun. He only has a handgun with two single bullets. And everything then seems like it's it's going to be even more imp impossible to actually win the day. However, the problem is with Die Hard, um, when talking about its historical context and the effect that it has had on culture, and especially now, seeing as culture has moved on and we look back and reevaluate movies, there is one kind of glaring issue with it, and that is now with the events of mm. Black Lives Matter. You look at this film now and can't help but see the fact that this is very clearly quite a gun happy police officer that has no issue with shooting people. On top of that, some of it is quite gory. Uh, there is some degree of fetishization of firearms, which is an all too common thing in American films where they, you know, in Baz Luhrmann's um, Romeo and Juliet, there's close-ups on the firearms, and it, it just seems, it seems very um, kind of gun porn-esque, which is which is quite problem problematic now with a modern audience. And there is one very famous infamous scene where after killing someone, John McClane writes on his uh, jumper, now I have a machine gun, ho, ho, ho. When you look at it now, you can't help but feel that's very mean-spirited, that some of the violence, due to the fact that the violence is very gory, it's clearly exaggerated violence. You know, when you shoot someone in the head in real life, it, it, what happens in Die Hard is not what happens in real life. Part of it is escapism. And you can't deny that the film is incredibly entertaining, but then you have to reevaluate it and consider things now. So um, the use of the environment in Die Hard is also incredibly important in a way, kind of almost very similar to uh, to how it was utilised in the westerns. In the case of this film, however, the environment in Die Hard is actually used to show contrast between John McClane and the people that are being held hostage. So at the very beginning of the movie, you see these people in this high to do, very fancy tower having a Christmas party and they work for a really successful uh, Japanese business firm and 
they are celebrating, they wear really fancy suits. The, the actual building that they are celebrating in, the part where they're celebrating, is incredibly beautiful. And you get this feeling that John McClane is not meant to be there. He doesn't belong with these people. And to probably his own wife maybe doesn't even belong with these people. So it's why when the film, the film introduces this aspect and then as it carries on, you get the fact that John McClane, while he doesn't belong there, he's the only person that can save these people because the people that have been held hostage do not have his skill set. And because of that, John McClane is so... While he is out of his depth, while he has a fish out of the water in terms of the environment, what he is exceptionally good at is his job. And that was quite different to a lot of these Western cowboys where they they owned their environment. They were, they were in the case of these American heroes of the Westerns, they, were, they felt most at home in the wide open expanses and then suddenly you have a you have a character who is who is completely out of step which is a really interesting change and also simply because John McClane shows elements of this cowboy hero he is quick to the draw even blowing smoke away from his gun in one of the final kills of the movie and Hans Gruber even asks him well he asks him this still the cowboy Mr. McClane Americans all alike and this is incredibly important because this goes to show that character characters, while they might be transported to different settings, elements of these characters, regardless if they be in a Western movie or if they be in a modern or be in a more modern day action movie, character archetypes remain the same. That is at the core of genre theory, and is one of the most important parts of genre theory is that they may change, they may evolve, they may develop, but some of it will always remain. Some of it will never change. In a post 9-11 world, the action in Western action movies became drastically centered around realistic forms of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Most films taking elements of Krav Maga, which is a style of, um, well, I'll let someone else explain. You shoot. Krav Maga is not a sport. It's meant to neutralize and disarm. Now, it's designed specifically for close quarter combat. So as you can see here, the whole design of action cinema and the movements that are actually being utilised actually drastically changed. Suddenly we were much more in the area of, no, this is how you would take care of this situation. And that was also carried on to the actual style of the films themselves. And films like Bourne especially took on to create a much more realistic look into the world of espionage. One of the biggest things to come out of this time in action cinema is actually the use of a shaky cam, documentarian mm. style of camera mm. work that was made popular by Paul Greengrass. And why? Um, and it has actually often been referred to as being kind of the bane of action movies. It's something that has often been seen as ruining action cinema. And, but it does have its good points. It can work. It can create a much more gritty, a much more visceral feel to your cinema. And the, and the fights as well, it can help them because if you've got an actor that is not the most skilled fighter but you decide to cast your lead for their acting ability rather than their fighting capability, it can hide the fact that they're not the best fighter because of the fact that you're moving the camera around. It can hide the fact they're not the best. And the thing is, with Paul Greengrass, his style actually works. And this is why. The series is actually edited in a similar way our consciousness and sensory perception works. How we first check out the frequent use of wide angle shots, or how most of the blows, the impacts, and brief inserts whenever a new weapon is acquired are all centered on the frame. And this is why that style works. It is an understanding of the human eye and why, at the heart of it, every decision still has to be brought down to how does the audience actually process the information of this fight? How do they process the geography? How do they process the addition of a new weapon being brought in? All of this creates great action. All of this creates the feeling of, of true authenticity. And that is why so many other filmmakers who have tried to take on Paul Greengrass's style, either because they thought it was good or because they were forced to by circumstance, they failed because they did not put the same level of thought and care into the, into the shots as Paul Greengrass does. He understood that just because your shots last for maybe two, three seconds, that doesn't mean you can be lazy. You still have to put every piece of thought into every single shot, else it's not gonna work. And that is why the Bourne series, despite utilizing shaky cam, is still so well revered by action fans. Because 
it's a it's it's less a film and it's more an actual visual experience. It's like a roller coaster ride with the with the pacing of the movie, with the with the way that the fight scenes are photographed. They are they are true experiences and they are unlike anything else. They are one of the most important film series in history. And also their use of environments have also drastically changed. So the wide open expanses of the Western are gone. They're replaced instead with massive urban centers being the main stage of the action, giving the film an extra sense of authenticity with real world landmarks often playing backdrop to the events in the film, giving the idea that these stories are happening next door to us. Instead of having a world untouched by civilization where the danger is now, it says the danger is in our coffee shops. It's in our walk home from work, perhaps even in our very own house. And what that does is it actually makes you go, oh, wow, this feels real. I've never been to the American Midwest, but what I have been to is I have been to London. I have been to the places where they have made these uh, Bourne movies, the Bond movies. And because of that, when I watch them, I come with a real understanding of I know people could do that because I've been there now. Because obviously this all came after 9-11, there have been debates uh, about the treatment of certain groups within the action genre at this time, especially with the films dealing with terrorism. They've been accused of Islamophobia, and that has been there have been definite issues with the way people are being represented in these movies, where they're always being uh, they're always being shown as being terrorists, always being shown as being bad people. It's it's never really looking at the actual reasons as to why and how. And what part does everyone play in creating this situation? But as of recently, there have been more American films, such as American Assassin, that have attempted to show the constantly changing politics of the Middle East and showing that government, at government level, places like Iraq, there are always good people that have a family and just want to go home. And that is something that is really important to film, I think, is because it can be very easy to just say these people are bad and that's it but what film can do is go these people have made these decisions and this is why and that is what action cinema is really really fantastic at when it's done correctly where you actually allow people to go wow i didn't think of that because people are so ready to be entertained by action cinema they're actually even more open to being shown a worldview and that is incredibly important also, in relation to genre theory and how it's not only movies that now have to be considered, novels such as the Orphan X series have took an advantage and a deconstruction into the trope of the former government assassin trained since birth, now turned vigilante. Well, the one thing I thought about with Orphan X is with all these archetypal characters who we love, the one thing we never get to see is you never get to see James Bond go home. You never get to see Jason Bourne have an awkward encounter in his apartment complex. True. <laughs> and so I've taken this character and put him in the real world. So Orphan X is a character who is this archetypal character, but he lives in the world with, with you and me. Yeah. And that is something that's really happening, really quite interestingly, with the kind of like the modern day spy thriller or the modern day spy action where you're actually kind of being born. It's like, well, if you train someone to be able to do these things, can they even be socially integrated? Can you have a conversation with them? Can they... Can they give something else to the world other than violence? Also, with the rise of the superhero action movie, characters like Captain America definitely takes a lot of part of John McClane and old John and old uh, John Wayne kind of all American hero under the new guys and gives the Ameri the idea of the American patriot a new lease on life with the idea of a true patriot being a hero who holds the people above him accountable as seen in Captain America Winter Soldier, where this scene occurs. This isn't freedom. This is fear. S.H.I.E.L.D. takes the world. So the reason why this is so important is because it actually does go away to describing political nuance, where certain people in Cap's position would actually be conventional soldiers, and they would be told to go and do something, and they would be expected to follow out that order. The reason why this version of Captain America is so crucial is it actually makes us go, well, no, if someone is, someone, no matter who they are, if someone is doing something that could be considered immoral, you have to do that. And you have to stand up, you have to fight. And that is a really important thing for children to watch. That is a really 
important thing to actually give to children to say to them like no you should you should stand up for what's right you shouldn't just do it because someone tells you and i think that is going to help create true political change within the world because there's an entire generation of young kids that have been exposed to that content and they will then go on to have that idea in real life and it doesn't come and the interesting thing with captain america is it doesn't come from a place of ego it comes from a place of a man who was in war and he's seen the effects of war and he doesn't want anyone else to have to deal with that he we took a leaf out of china's book and we said okay well we're going to get stunt guys to actually direct the movies for us so you had films like john wick you've had films like atomic blonde you have films like extraction which was probably the most recent version of that idea in which you gave stunt guys the director's chair, so they're going to direct the performances, they're going to direct the answers, but they're also going to be the ones actually physically directing the, the action sequences, which is incredible for the action, because what has occurred is we've allowed action directors who have done a few great fight sequences, then get told, here you go, here's, here's all this money, now give us a really great performance as well, you need to give us, you need to actually form everything to create a larger unison, which is obviously the story as a whole, and a lot of them really, really struggle. And that can be seen in this review from Extraction. And it says, It's fine for action movie escapist fare, but throughout one gets the feeling that the movie wouldn't have, be, wouldn't have been that much different if it had just dispensed with a story altogether. And that's really sad, because action has the ability to tell amazing stories. It has the ability to inform people. It has the ability to, as I mentioned before, to open people's minds to ideas because they only went to be entertained. And when you get films that don't understand the fact that they still need to tell a really good story, it's always a waste. No matter how good your action is, it's never good enough unless your story is good as well. Your story needs to be great. Your characters need to be believable. Your transformation of character needs to be believable. It needs to be understandable and it needs to further the theme of your story. And this is something that Chinese film really always understood, which is the idea you have the action and you have the story and the two work together in the same way that the actors' performances and the cinematography work together. And also the biggest thing I felt with Extraction was they have a one-shot sequence, which according to the director was meant to put you into the seat with the characters. It was meant to be as if you were really there with them. But instead, it does the opposite. The camera does movements that a single person could never do in one attempt. It gives you the feeling... Uh, of grandeur when the rest of the film seems to be going for this degree of authenticity and perhaps even realistic depictions and it undermines the rest of the story it 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 becomes a showcase rather than actually meaningful sequence of events that further the story and it's interesting because extraction again it takes elements that have been prevalent throughout the genre it takes a hero who believes all he's good for is is the violence is the killing and and that's really sad that harkens back to westerns as well with shane when he goes there's no living with the killing it's a shame when you get a genre that has come as far as action has and then yet seem to not seemingly reach its full potential especially in the case of extraction over the course of the last hundred years action cinema as a genre has changed shifted and even morphed into something that is not only reactionary but something that creates genuine reaction it is one of the longest running genres in film history and has has given us some of the great cultural touchstones in human history so the question is where is action going to go recently the uk government announced they are going to be downsizing the army to make ways for more drones and further advancements into cyber warfare and Perhaps that's where action cinema is going to go, as it's always been the genre that shifts most with the times. Perhaps in time, action cinema will become a virtual-based reality experience. Perhaps it will, even as politics change and as we're more and more of a knife edge, similar to the Cold War, perhaps the enemies we face and the political edges of the films of yesteryear will make a return. But whatever the enemy and wherever the film is depicted as occurring, one thing's for sure, action cinema will remain it will simply just change and evolve along with the filmmakers that make them.